Greetings from Michigan State University this morning and welcome to EAB University's fall webinar series which is funded by the USDA Forest Service. My name is Robin Usborne and along with my EAB University colleagues Amy Stone from The Ohio State University and Dr. Cliff Sadoff from Purdue University, we welcome you to today's presentation entitled Managing Your Local EAB Situation. Our presenter today is EAB University's own Cliff Sadoff, entomologist at Purdue University, who is well known for his work on EAB and EAB issues since the pest was found in the early 2000s. Before we get started today, please know that we welcome your comments and questions, so please feel free to type them in the chat feature, which you can find by mousing over the bottom or occasionally the top of your screen. We will make a note of the questions and we'll have Cliff respond to them when his presentation is finished. To keep these free webinars coming, we need your feedback. After the webinar, I will be providing a link to a short voluntary confidential survey that I hope you will take the time to fill out. I will also send this email link, send this link out in an email after the webinar as well in case you're not able to connect to it today during the webinar. Also, if you're one of the first 10 people to fill out the survey, we will be sending you an EAB goodie bag, but we hope you'll give us feedback either way. For those of you wanting CEUs, if you would like a certificate indicating that you participated in today's live webinar, complete the survey and send an email message to Amy Stone at stone.91 at osu.edu. Certificates will be mailed to you within a week of today's program. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing soon at www.emeraldashborer.info. You will also find the recordings for all previous EAB University webinars there. Thank you for attending today, and Cliff, please unmute your microphone, share your screen with your presentation, and we'll get started. Okay, <clears throat> I'm unmuting as we speak, and I'm sharing my screen <laughs> as we speak, and I'll share screen. So. Does everybody see a slide that says managing your local EAP situation? Yes, we can. I can see it. Perfect. Okay, thanks. <laughs> You're the only one who can, <laughs> who can respond to me like this. Okay, great. All right, so today uh, what I want to do is pretty much give you a, let's see what happened here. Okay, uh, so I want to give you a, 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 an update about what, what's going on. And I'll start by talking, reviewing a little bit about how Emerald Ash Borer kills trees just so that we're all on the same page. Uh, give you some uh, pesticide updates because there's been a lot of developments in this area over the past season. And uh, then I want to talk about uh, probably one of the biggest problems we have, which, which is how to get the communities involved in trying to protect their ash trees before all the ash trees are killed. And then uh, I'll review some of the tools that we've developed to help you do this more effectively. Okay. Emerald ash borer, as we probably, as you probably all know, has a, has a, uh, an annual life cycle, meaning that it takes one year to go from egg to egg. Uh, right now, uh, you you will see that there are uh, they they are uh, just beneath the bark uh, in uh, late stage uh, larvae. Uh, some of them might are, are, are have pupated, and then uh, what happens is that in May the adults will come out, and then uh, either make their characteristic D-shapes exit holes, and then uh, I'm assuming you can all see my arrow here. Uh, and then uh, in May and June, the adults will mate. Uh, uh, they will feed on the leaves, uh, the, and the females will lay eggs. The eggs will hatch into larvae, and then the larvae will etch beneath the bark. Uh, it's kind of critical to talk about what happens in May. In May, the females really have to feed for about three weeks or so in order to gain enough food to be able to lay their eggs. And when we use insecticides, we have in, uh, insecticides in these leaves that, that actually focuses on killing these females before they can lay eggs. And then, of course, uh, they can kill the insects once they're beneath the trunk of the tree as well. But um, the way they kill trees uh, is if you look in the, in the, in the right-hand corner of the slide, you see a little pizza-shaped wedge 
of, uh, of a piece of wood. And in the center, we have the heartwood, which is what holds the trees up. And then we have the sapwood, which conducts the water from the roots up into the leaves. And uh, then uh, the beyond that, we have an area called the cambium, which produces uh, the phloem, which moves the nutrients from the leaves down to the roots. And then, of course, we have the bark. It turns out that ash trees are a kind of a tree called ring porous trees, which means they have only one layer, one ring of active conducting uh, sapwood, active conducting uh, uh, xylem, which is responsible for moving the water up to the leaves. So as the emerald ash borer feeds, as you see the larvae get bigger and bigger and bigger on the lower right, as they start feeding more and more into this uh, EAB feeding zone, they begin to etch the uh, uh, xylem, the functional xylem of this ring layer, and uh, they cut off the water, and that's what, 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 what kills the trees. And so you can imagine that when you have a dead part underneath the bark and the live part on the other side expands, it pulls the bark apart and it cracks, and that's when you see these vertical splits developing. And one of the things you'll notice is uh, the first signs you'll probably see is you might noticing some thinning in the upper in the upper canopy, and they, they and that's largely because they tend to start feeding on the upper canopy first first, and then they they, they move move their their way down. Okay, so um, you know so. Uh, I guess I guess go, moving back to that. I guess the, the the other thing that's really important to note is that this is not like um, a defoliating pest. Defoliating pest, like say a gypsy moth or a Japanese beetle, which removes the leaves up from a tree, uh, uh, will just it's only a temporary problem because the trees can produce leaves again. They can relief after a defoliation event. With the case of emerald ash borer, the tree, the part of the tree that produces the leaves, that particular branch, becomes too sick to produce new leaves. So when it's so when uh, that part becomes thin, I mean that 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 part is, is essentially gone gone forever. So how can we can we protect trees the, the, uh, from being killed? Uh, we've got this bulletin uh, available at EAB and at the info and, and at an Emerald Ash Bore and at Emerald Ash Bore uh, website uh, uh, on insecticide options. This is a research-based information uh, done by a, a group of us. Uh, who have uh, been working with emerald ash borer, and uh, we, we give the, the latest science-based information. And, and one of the things we've been learning, I guess, has been some re recent articles that came out uh, by uh, Dan McCulloch and Therese Pollan that sort of clarified this a bit, is we now have a much better understanding of how these insecticides work. And we've got four basic actors, okay? We've got imidacloprid uh, and donateferin, which are both neonicotinoids. We have emamectin benzoate, Okay, which is in, in injected into the tree, and we have azadiractin, which is a, a growth regulator based on the neem tree that's also injected in the trees. All these compounds have to be have to move from the roots up into the leaves, and water carries the pesticides. So if you have a drought after you've applied this, it's a really good idea to keep it watered at least for a month after the application is made so the material can get up in, into the canopy. Otherwise, the product just won't, won't, won't work. And it turns out that uh, emamectin benzoate uh, is probably the most toxic to the beetles. Uh, it kills the first larvae. None of these, these insecticides kill the eggs, but this emamectin benzoate will kill the first larval instar, which is called L1, the second larva lens star, the third, and even the fourth larva lens star, L L4, and just one or two bites will 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 kill uh, a, an adult. Uh, Dinotefuran will only only the first two larval lens stars are being killed, and it just takes a few bites for the adults to die. And imidacloprid, the the first two larval lens stars are killed, but it takes sustained feeding by the adults to be killed. Azadiractin works in a much different manner. Uh, by uh, killing insects as they molt, so all larval in immature stages are are in fact uh, susceptible to this this product, but it's non toxic to the adult. It won't kill the adults, and it just reduces the fecundity of females or the number of eggs that they produce. So let's talk about some good news. Good news is that we now know that big trees can be protected. I took this picture in Indiana. Uh, at Eagle Creek Park near Indianapolis on May 22nd, and the tree on the left has a DBH, a diameter breast height uh, of 39 inches. Okay, and there's a footbridge, and my six-foot-tall graduate student 
is standing on the, on the left-hand side of the bridge. And on the right side, uh, beyond the bridge, we have a tree which was not treated. So clearly, you know, uh, by a judicious application of insecticide, we can protect very big trees. So there's no real limit to the size. One of the, probably the most interesting part of this uh, study is that, you know, we had uh, 30 trees in the study. We started it in 2013 and we injected it uh, with five mils of triage, which is uh, one, uh, which is a 4% uh, solution of emamectin benzoate. Uh, and we did it in 2013 and repeated it again in 2016. The, uh, the triangles, which is the line which increases, uh, uh, refers to the untreated trees that began with about 10 or 15 percent, about 10 percent uh, canopy thinning in 2013 and escalated to uh, 92 percent canopy thinning by 2016, uh, shows what happens when emerald ash borer, when these trees are not treated for emerald ash borer. The, uh, the spring treatment, which was treated in June, uh, was uh, you'll notice that that it held uh, the uh, thinning to eighteen uh, percent by two thousand sixteen. Okay, when we when we reapplied uh, the fall application uh, held the canopy thinning down to uh, about thirty eight percent. And the reason for this is that essentially these th these trees were treated a little bit late in the game, and uh, there was a whole other season for these tree beetles to feed. Uh, on the trees before uh, you know uh, to allow them to cause cause more damage. So the take home point of the slide is you notice so this y axis here represents the how thin a tree is. So the 100% would be say a, a leafless tree, completely thin. What happens is that we are able to hold down thinning uh, with a single injection of five mils uh, uh, per inch dBh of triage. Uh, once every three years on very large trees, ranging from 28 to 62 inches in diameter. Okay, so uh, one of the things that's important to note is that on the label, it says you need to apply it every every two years. And uh, there, the, there's a process that's involved to thinking about changing the rates, but if you wanted to actually um, save money in an urban program, um, this data I hope would be convincing to show that you could probably get away with treating it once every, every three years. And that, that really makes a big difference in the economics, which I'll get to a little bit later on. Second headline news is that um, there is another product called Arbormectin produced by Rotam, uh, which uh, we are seeing, we did another study uh, at a golf course near Lafayette, Trees about the same size, average DBH of about 32 inches, uh, a little wider range in the number in the size, uh, and we found that the arbormectin and the triage product behaved pretty much in the same manner. So what we see uh, once again uh, in 2013, uh, all three treatments had very low levels of canopy thinning, uh, which was maintained to less than 10 percent for uh, both the arbormectin and the triage treatments. Uh, and uh, while the controls, untreated controls, pretty much uh, ran away, um, the uh, arbormectin uh, product is uh, is not a restricted use product, uh, unlike the, the, the unlike the triage product. And the nice thing to know is that it um, it performed just as well as 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 as, as the triage product. Um, I, I want, and, and so 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 that's a. Uh, that's very helpful. Now, it, the dose that we used was a little bit different. At the time when we were doing this, we were using something which was called the Chicago Protocol, which was on some of the older labels of the uh, of triage that would, would step up the rate of, of application from 5 to 10 mils uh, on trees that were between uh, you know, 20 to uh, 40 inches and uh, between 20 and 30 inches, based on this on, on the size, so it was it was, it was a graduated uh, protocol. So uh, it was more than five mils per inch. So this is at a, at a somewhat higher rate than the previous study, but the point of the story is that the Arborjet and the Arbormectin seem to work just as well, and that's really good to know because the Arborjet now has got a, a, a new formulation of triage, which is called G4, which is very similar to the Arbormectin product. And, and based on what I'm seeing here, I expect that, 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 that both products will work uh, uh, 
quite well. Uh, this study here was done by my colleague Dan Herms at OSU, and uh, what he found, this is sort of shows that even on, that he did a study on, on some somewhat smaller trees, and he found that, you know, when you look at canopy decline, this was a single application uh, in 2006. It held the trees for two years, and by year three, there was a little bit of a breakup in the uh, efficacy of some of this, of, of some of the, the, the products, but... Um, but the thing is that the, the, you know, a reapplication would, would, would probably help that. So it's consistent with what we've seen before. Um, so the question is, you know, what is the, the best dose uh, that you should use of uh, amamectin uh, benzoate at this, at, at this point in time? Well, Herms shows that, you know, uh, we can control up to two and a half uh, 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 trees up to 25 inches uh, with a two and a half, five or 10 mils per inch for every two years. Smitley shows that you can actually go with a lower dose up to four years of control with two and a half mils uh, uh, per inch. And, th and this is really good uh, along with the data that I showed you today. I think we got some, you know, using these, these uh, rates on these higher rates on some of these uh, large trees seems, seems to work quite well. And I think this, this, this five mils really every three years should be the, the go-to place for, uh, for, for some of these uh, larger trees. Uh, but there's another product that came out uh, last year, last spring uh, called uh, Boxer, which is used, uh, which is formulated for the Wedgel. And uh, I have yet to see any data that support uh, its efficacy. Uh, and uh, this is kind of important because the rate, the, the system that they use with the Wedgel system, it's, it's, it's an injection needle that uh, there's no drilling that's involved. And uh, as such, there's only 1.6 mils per inch of product is actually delivered, and, and, and that's what's on the label on a tree that, uh, on a, for a 25-inch uh, diameter tree. And uh, this is really important because, you know, if you don't deliver enough product, uh, you're not going to get efficacy. Now, since I haven't seen data, the closest thing I have is data uh, from... Uh, when uh, the wedgel was used to deliver imidacloprid, uh, a product that seemed that works quite well on small trees, and this was tested on trees with an average DBH of, of 11 inches uh, by my colleague Dan Herms. And what we can see here is he started it in August of 2010 on trees which were started out with about 30% canopy decline, and he found that both the Zytec drench and triage was able to hold uh, the damage steady, but the pointer just simply did not deliver enough product. So um, unless, you know, so, so I think that, you know, uh, there is a temptation to try to use Boxer uh, because it, you use less product uh, and it takes less time because there's no drilling, but um, it hasn't really been tested as, as, as uh, extensively as the other products. So uh, I would recommend not using it at this time. Okay, um, so we now uh, are going to move to, a, a, I'm going to switch a little bit from uh, the technology of how to protect trees to how to work with communities. You know, and, and if you think about protecting EAB in the urban forest, you know, one of the, we have three things we have to do. We have to demonstrate feasibility of control with tools, and I think I've done that on the first part of this talk. And then uh, we have to get the community to care enough about it to, to act to get a call to actions early in the process so that we can financially justify the expenditures necessary to save the trees. And early intervention, you know, is, is fairly key for, for saving an ash tree. We develop, we have an, a smartphone app called uh, the Purdue Tree Doctor, uh, available at purdueplantdoctor.com. And, uh, you know, in addition to, uh, you, know, you know, one of the, uh, you know, we have a uh, uh, 60 different genera of trees that we cover on there with, with 180 different plant disorders. But we have entries in there for the emerald ash borer. And uh, on that, we have, this is, I just, I took this screenshot from, from the app. Uh, and, and, and it shows that, you know, in sites, you know, we can have, in a single site, you can actually have a, quite a range of, of, of canopy thinning. And, you know, one of the things we run into is that when you're talking to clients, uh, uh, or citizens in your community about canopy thinning, they have no idea what you're talking about. They barely even know what an ash tree is, let alone what thinning is. So we got lots of series of pictures, and this is sort of a composite picture that I like to use, because on the left, you can see a tree with about 10% canopy thinning. Uh, in the middle, you see one which is 30%, then you see one which is 50%. And that kind of shows uh, pretty much the range of you know, uh, how, how thinning actually progresses. The other thing, uh, uh, this uh, using a stoplight analogy, on the left, you see... Uh, 
trees which are good with less than 10% canopy thinning have pretty much the best shot at uh, being protected. Uh, those with 30% thinning, you know, you really want to call a certified arborist in at this point in time because those trees, uh, you know, we need to know whether or not the tree that is still alive is, is worth saving. This particular tree, you know, the, the, the canopy, the, the, the tree structure is still going to be there and it's definitely worth, worth, worth protecting. But the one on the right, which is at 50% thinning, you know, if we treat that tree, the green part of that tree will stay alive, but then the the brown part, the tree without the leaves, would part of the tree without the leaves will, will be killed. I mean, and, and it's not going to come back. So if you can imagine that tree with 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 uh, the dead part all lopped off, it's really really not worth worth saving. So early in, in intervention re really is, is is going to be key. So how do you get things moving? A couple of years ago, we developed a project a program called uh, NAB Neighbors Against Bad Bugs. Uh, where we were working with master gardeners and communities to get people aware of ash trees so that they would uh, act before it was too late uh, to, save, to save the tree. And uh, this is a lot of fun. Uh, you know, this is uh, the former city uh, uh, arborist of Lafayette, uh, Belinda Kiger, and the mayor okay, uh, of, of, of Lafayette, Indiana. And we were, were, were tagging trees um, to uh, promote awareness. Um, and uh, what ash trees are, uh, we had lots of community events, and it was it was a lot of fun. A lot of lot of uh, used a lot of social media and local media to to get the word out, and it really got the community aware of of of, of ash trees. Um, the uh, this sort of has been developing over time, uh, and you know, and, and this map uh, as a map of Indiana, and the green part is what what uh, Phil Marshall, uh, our state. Uh, uh, Plant health. Uh, our state entomologist, former state entomologist, likes to call the EAB death wave. He, death wave. He flew over the state, and the green part is where emerald ash borer has killed uh, the majority of the ash trees already. So most of the state, you know, has a lot of the ash trees have, have been killed throughout throughout a lot of the state. This is what he calls the death wave. But you know, in 2008, uh, we had the city forester uh, Chad Tinkle was working with local communities to get community bids so they can uh, get. Uh, save from bulk pricing. Uh, in Indianapolis, this was repeated in 2011 where there was a, a, a community organization working with trees called Keep Indianapolis Beautiful that partnered with the Indy Parks uh, Department, part of the city of Indianapolis, as well as a neighborhood association in the King Park area to work together to uh, assess trees and determine which trees needed to be saved and which trees needed to be removed. And then uh, in Evansville now in 2016, there is a, uh, uh, where, which is where the star is on the lower uh, lower left part of the Indianapolis map, Indiana map. Uh, they have a program where uh, they've partnered with, with True Green and uh, there's a, a foundation where people can donate to uh, adopt a tree and True Green will work with them to give them a, a bulk pricing on treatment. So you can see things have changed over time now that we are found that it's much more reliable, we can more reliably demonstrate that we can actually save trees. Okay, the trick though we have now is how do you get people to care before it's too late? You know, it's really easy to tag trees to indicate the scope of the problem. But it's very difficult to get them to, to communicate a sense of urgency. And I'm going to show you some slides that really communicate this. Okay, um, just a little personal. Personal. My father lives in New Jersey, uh, where Emerald Ash Borer was just found, and I visit him in the summertime. I always visit him as much as I can. Uh, but this is uh, on a street nearby where he lives, uh, which is uh, in Monroe Township, New Jersey. And these are ash trees uh, that are fully leafed out that look quite beautiful, uh, as you can see. Uh, this is the time when you really have to mobilize people to protect your ash trees. And it's very difficult to do. I mean, looking at these, these trees, uh, you know, they, they, they look perfect, okay? Well, it turns out that, I, that the arrow on the upper left side of this, of this photo over here is where I took that picture, these, uh, the, these ash trees right over here. And then uh, about uh, 400 yards away, I actually detected emerald ash borer in a parking lot in September of 2015. So, you know, I happen to know that emerald ash borer is only 400 yards away from those trees. And, you know, and uh, I would advise these folks to uh, actually treat those trees in order to protect it. But it's very difficult to mobilize people because they don't really see any problem. They say, my tree looks great. How can it possibly, 
How can they possibly go wrong? How could you compare my beautiful trees in my lawn to those crappy little ash trees that are in the parking lot that, that are half dead from other reasons? Well, you know, uh, this is tough uh, because, you know, the time that people really care is when it looks like this. This is a picture that I took two years ago in Lafayette, Indiana, in West Lafayette, Indiana, where the trees are essentially half dead. People are saying, what can I do to save the trees? And we say nothing at this point in time. It's time just to take a chainsaw out so you can start taking down those trees before they fall down with the cars uh, beneath them. So uh, in, in order to get people moving, we, to get a sense of, of urgency, we need some way of predicting how much time you have left before the, the trees start, start dying. And so one of the things that we, we did is we developed this model for um, uh, predicting what was going on. And, and it's a real simple model. We just assume that every single year, the number of trees that are, that are affected by emerald ash borer will double every year. And my colleague, Chad Tinkle from uh, Fort Wayne, uh, was kind enough to share his tree removal data. He detected it in emerald ash borer in 2006, and he was looking at the number of ash trees that were removed over time. And they removed over 14,000, this is not an exaggeration, they removed over 14,000 ash trees from the time emerald ash borer was first detected in the canopy until uh, the last, uh, until the trees were, were all killed by, by, by the, the untreated trees were all killed by emerald ash borer. And so we assumed that the, the number affected, would, the percentage affected would double every year. So in year one, we'd have 1% affected. In year two, we'd have 2% affected. And I just sort of calculated, like say, what 2% what of the 14,000 total was to get an idea of, of what the predicted value was. And then the blue line would represent what was actually observed. And you can see the black predicted line and the blue line pretty much correspond pretty well. There's a little difference in 2011, 2012, but by, by 2013, I mean, things seem to converge. And, and you know, uh, this is, could be quite handy if we could use this to actually predict what's going on before the trees start dying. And that's exactly what we did is we, uh, my colleague Matt Ginzel and I uh, developed a way for uh, surveying trees uh, before they uh, are, are dead in order to see where, 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 where you are in the ash decline cycle. It turns out, so what we recommend is that you just take uh, equal numbers of trees, uh, preferably 50 trees uh, that have less than 10% canopy thinning and 50 uh, ash trees that have between 10 and 30% canopy thinning and mark them. And then when you go back in year two, survey the same trees and record the number of, the number of trees that have lost more than 30% of the canopy thinning. And that number, the percentage of the total trees that you're surveying will tell you what year you're in in the decline cycle. So, for example, if you have, say, 4% of your trees, uh, of the 100 trees, 4 out of the 100 trees that you count have lost more than 30% of the canopy, you are in year 3, you are in year three of the cycle. Okay? And we, we validated this information in two ways. We worked, one spot was in, in Sam Park in Indianapolis. Uh, where uh, we know the tree was introduced on the, the emerald ash borer was introduced on nursery stock about a mile and a half from the park, uh, and then we started our project in 2010, and we uh, noticed that uh, by 2011, you know, we were well into the decline cycle, you know, in excess of a 40 a percent trees with can with greater than 30 percent canopy thinning and uh you know it, it increased dramatically in 2012 and then uh, 2013 you know sort of seems to level up but we're pretty much we're, we're close to 100 percent uh we did this again in 2000 uh, at, at another site we in lafayette indiana before emerald ash borer was actually detected and we started the project in 2010 and we found uh that uh the, the canopy decline uh, in 2011 uh, pretty much matched pretty well the what we call the predicted model. Uh, but in 2012, we, it, it, we had a bit of an aberration. We, we observed a lot more canopy thinning than we inspect, expected. But that 2012 was a huge drought. Uh, but that was followed by a, 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 an awful lot of a rain, and trees actually seemed to recover a little bit. But... Uh, once by 2014, 2015, it's, it started getting on track again. Uh, so, so we really think we have a, a really good way to tell people what what's going on. This is really important because you know, uh, in the early years, when there is less than eight percent, okay, of the trees 
uh, having losing more than thirty percent of their canopy, it's kind of difficult to, to to detect. Okay, you know that's when you know it's you have we have lots of time, and lots of options, but it's relatively difficult to 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 detect. Uh, emerald ash borer. It's easier to detect uh, later in the season when you know you have 16 or 32 percent. You know, 32 uh, percent means one out of every three trees has lost more than 30 percent of their canopy. I mean, that's really easy to see. One out of six trees is also fairly easy to see, but one out of 12 ash trees is a little at, at, at year number four is a little bit more more difficult to see. So one of the things that you know, and then really by the time you get to um, uh, by the time you get to uh, year seven, when two thirds of the trees are, are 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 gone, there's only a third left. Really, it's too late to protect these things. So one of the things I wanted to know is is it, uh, it asks, are these interventions worth it? You know, and I use this. We have this uh, program called the Emerald Ash Borer Cost Calculator, which I think I've talked about before. That uses this model that uh, uh, this this ash decline model uh, to uh, predict uh, the progression over time of, of, of tree loss. And then we, we, we provide instructions on here on how to stage your infestation. So the procedure I discussed today is actually uh, clearly specified uh, on that link over there. And this is available at eabindiana.info. Um, and the model, you know, just uses a, um, assumes that in the first 10 years, of the cycle, uh, we're going to uh, have to be very aggressive in trying to protect our trees from emerald ash borer. And that means, uh, you know, using uh, the uh, mmectin benzoate uh, once every three years, uh, especially on, 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 the, on the large trees. And then uh, as uh, a, uh, after uh, the, uh, uh, the, so what happens is if you look at the, this graph over here, you know, the I've been showing you these graphs of the y-axis represents the percentage of affected ash that say have lost these uh, these squares, the ones that have lost uh, more than 30% of their canopy. It goes up to 100% by year eight. The diamonds would represent the hypothetical population of emerald ash borer in the area, in the community. And, uh, you know, the population will uh, Decline uh, after 10 years or so. This is sort of a vague line. We don't know for sure, but after 10 years or so, when um, most of the ash in resource in the area has essentially been killed, there's nothing left for the emerald ash borer to feed on. And then, so after this period of time, you know, the population of emerald ash borer will go down. It never goes to zero, and it'll probably go back up again over time. We don't. This part we're kind of hazy on, but. But what we do know that there's going to be a, a greatly depressed abundance of emerald ash borer, and the trees should be able to get by with less less insecticide use. Um, so we assumed that we had 1,600 ash trees in this model that I, I used to sort of to, to demonstrate, to test to see whether or not it's worth saving the trees early in the process or late in the process. And I assumed that uh, it costs $5 per inch to treat a tree, assuming we had a bulk pricing uh, using a municipal rate. And we would treat these trees every three years through year 10. And then in the maintenance phase, we would treat them once every five years, assuming we have to do a little touch up every now and then. And we're gonna assume the treatment saved 95% of the trees, okay? And the annual mortality of replace or save tree is, uh, was 5%. Uh, we're comparing what happens if you reactively replace the ash, which means replace the ash that are unsalvageable or poor, or proactively replace them uh, over over uh, the remaining years where the trees are being attacked, and then, uh, or you can save all trees with with a DBH of greater than 12 inches, so saving just the larger trees. And what we found, so the the black line represents the annual cost if. Of, of removing and replacing the trees as they die. And you see that early in the game, the first four years, when there's not much in, uh, uh, insect uh, injury, uh, costs are low, but once the trees all start dying, costs just go through the roof. Uh, if we start this in year five, uh, the because we're compressing the removal of the trees into fewer years, uh, the costs are, are, annual costs are a lot are, are more expensive. If we proactively replace uh, the trees, remove and replace trees over time, okay, just e removing and replacing equal numbers of ash trees over time, the costs uh, are, are, are a little bit more level over the, over the cost because we don't have to have, because we're, 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 uh, we're paying more early on for removing the trees. We don't get this big peak later on. Same thing happens if you start in year five, but the, but the annual costs are a little bit higher. 
if we treat every three years, we see that you know there's some peaks of costs when we uh, start treating, but after time, the you know we have intervals where we're not really uh, treating as 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 frequently, and the costs are low. And this is echoed in, in year five. On a cumulative basis, you know, the uh, what we see is that the cumulative cost represents the the sum of all the costs over time, over this 25 year period. And we see that removing and replacing the trees costs far more than it does to save the trees over a 25 year period, okay? If you start in year one and also if you start in year five, okay? So I, I, I think that, uh, you know, clearly, you know, we, we can, uh, the costs are gonna be lower over time. And then of course the benefits are also gonna be, gonna be higher over, uh, over time if you actually save your trees. You know, if you, if you uh, save trees, this is the, this graph represents the <clears throat> total tree diameters. In other, words, in other words, if you would just measure all the tree diameters and, 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 and line them up end to end and see how long that would be, that would tell you how, how much forest, rough indicated amount of forest that you would have. So you basically have a lot more forest, which is the blue line, which is the saving the large trees, that, that then you would have if you um, had not uh, the, have you had to remove, if you removed and replaced the trees. So I think that this, what we're, the point of the story here is that saving trees with insecticides costs less than removing and replacing them and gives you more benefit. And if we look at this in terms of uh, a discounted cost to produce uh, 25 years of accumulated benefits, the cost per, per unit of length, in that case use a meter of, of diameter of breast height, uh, are, 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 are kind of astounding here. One of, the, one of the first thing I noticed is that whether you start in year one or you start in year five, uh, the cost of reactively replacing the trees, proactively replacing trees, treating the large ones, treating the best half, treating the best 80% or treating all, pretty much are consistent through year one, uh, if you start in year one or year five. They're, the numbers, are, they're a little bit different, but they're, but they're fairly similar across, across these, uh, these columns. But um, if we look at reactive replacement and proactive replacement, these prices are about three times what it costs to save the trees, okay? So the cost per accumulated year of benefits over time really are, uh, are phenomenal. So you're getting a threefold increase just in terms of, 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 of costs uh, to conserve a meter of diameter of, of breast height. And, uh, you know, these, you know, as I said, the, the $5 cost that I use in the simulation uh, is uh, somewhere right around here. And what I noticed is that we did a survey of municipal bids uh, of the price per inch DBH to uh, treat uh, trees with MMECT and benzoate. We found that when we had less than 200 trees, uh, the price pretty much varies all over the place in a bid. But when we got more than 200 trees, it was pretty much between four and six dollars, okay, uh, per, per inch. So th these are actually realistic numbers. Now, what I want to do now is kind of put this all together and recommend something which I like to call the community, the urban community action cycle. And it's based very much on what my concept of, uh, of, of, of aggressively uh, protecting your trees uh, during the initial invasion wave and then uh, maintaining them with lower doses of insecticides on an as, on an as needed basis uh, after all the untreated trees have been killed. And so the first thing that we want to start off with is that when emerald ash borer is found in your state, when emerald ash borer is in the area, what you want to do is just start with it with a NAB, Neighbors Against Bad Bugs Ash Awareness Campaign. I mean, I've, after working on this tree, this system for 12 years, I'm, I'm pretty much convinced that nobody knows what an ash tree looks like until it starts dying in front of their trees, unless they happen to be a tree, an avid tree uh, lover like like myself and probably most of you who are listening today, they don't really know what ash trees look like. So if we at least let them know that they have ash trees in, in the community and, and get an idea of the amount of ash, maybe by conducting an inventory to see how much of the forest that is at risk, that would be really helpful. Once it's found in the county, okay, or within 15 miles of the place that you want to, want to uh, protect, then I would recommend that you would uh, identify 50 trees which are good, 50 trees which have lost less than 10% of their canopy, 
or have experienced less than 10% of canopy thinning, and another 50 trees that have lost between 10 and 30% of, 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 of canopy thinning, uh, I would recommend you would identify those 100 trees and monitor them every year, okay? And then when you start noticing that these uh, trees are, and then that way you can figure out where you are in this invasion cycle. So that, you know, so, so that because the reality of it is, is that we have a very, very small window to start control, okay? So the earlier you start control between year one, year one and year six, the more trees you're going to be able to save. And as you approach year six, when, uh, two, when, when a third of the trees have lost more than 30% of the canopy, that's pretty much the end of your opportunity window, and then you wind up having to sort of save, having to just to replace all, all, all your trees. So I think that, that, that uh, you, you, you know, this is uh, what I would recommend if you want to use the latest thinking on this thing, this is how I would, would proactively prepare, prepare my, my community. So in summary, uh, the technology for uh, protecting large trees is advancing, and there's hope for communities that must see the browns of the branches, the browning branches before they act. You know, I would really recommend that if you have any uh, uh, P, uh, uh, PR, uh, p public relations or, or, or uh, media outlet, uh, you would want to publicize as much as possible uh, all trees that are dying as soon as you start seeing them because that's how you get people to be concerned about it because they really it's really hard for them to imagine their beautiful trees dying as I showed you from those folks from those uh, pictures in, in, in New Jersey senators can monitor and stage infestations uh, with visual tools and the smartphone apps are, they're great you can have the phone in your pocket you can show your your your, your citizens or your, your clients what damage looks like so they can actually you know see what it is you're talking about because it really is a bit of a it is fairly complicated for somebody who's not familiar with working with trees. And then, um, uh, and uh, I think uh, the cost calculator can be used to help uh, you inform decision making to decide what proportion of the trees you want saved and which ones you want, you want to uh, uh, remove and, and replace. Okay, um, this work uh, has done, been done with, with an awful lot of people uh, in, in a number of states, uh, supported by, by, by NIFA and, and, and the Forest Service. And with that, I'm happy to take uh, questions. So uh, this is just a plug for EABU. Uh, we know we've got two more webinars uh, coming up uh, in, the, in the next uh, few weeks, and I just wanted to keep it on so you can sort of mark your calendars. Thanks. Thank you, Cliff. Um, we have one question up here that says the table from John Woodmancy that says the table looks like trees were treated every other year. That wouldn't would imply a once every two years treatment, would it not? Which I'm not sure which ta the table. It would have been earlier in the pr presentation. Okay, the table. No, the, the okay the the trees. Okay, okay the tables that are. Okay. The um, the label states for emmectin benzoate is that trees should be treated every every uh, other year. Okay, the research that I showed uh, in Eagle Creek and the one that I showed in uh, Lafayette Golf Course, these were treated once every three years. So I'm not sure what the question is. So I'm not sure what table he's referring to, but I think the take home point is that you can save your trees if you treat them once every three years. The emmectin benzoate. The other products. Uh, now, now, this is you know, when I'm talking about emmectin benzoate. I'm really focusing on professional applications on, on large number from large numbers of trees. Homeowners have uh, really good tools available. They can still use imidacloprid, uh, uh, or if a, or if a, a contractor wants to use dinotefran. But these pro or products have to be applied every single year. Uh, the imidacloprid works best on trees that are less than 20 inches in diameter. Uh, and uh, if you skip a year, you, you, have, you stand to, to, to lose, lose your trees. But homeowners who want to do it themselves, I mean, they, they can. Uh, the closer you get to a 20 inch DBH tree, the dicier the imidacloprid uh, control gets. But, uh, you know, uh, that's, you know that, 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 that's just saying that in many cases, homeowners can still protect their trees by doing it themselves. Any other questions?
There we go. Now we, yes, we do. We have another question. Um, it says, uh, Beth Mays asks, is there any chance that these pesticides can biomagnify and affect the woodpeckers that feed on the larval stages? Now, just before you answer, I just want to say that there is a document on the emeraldashboard.info website called Potential Side Effects of EAB Insecticides. Um, as a, uh, That's a... Um, frequently asked questions that does answer this as well but if you had any more insight um, that'd be great. yeah well you know the, the term biomagnify uh, refers to uh, I, I, I often like to think of it in terms of fish okay and you know like they have a saying little uh, 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 you know you have the little fish are eaten by bigger fish and yet who are eaten by yet bigger fish and if you have a uh, uh, a fish that eats a contaminated, a small contaminated fish, uh, each predator in that chain of predators would wind up accumulating more and more, in, more and more of this contaminant. Okay, so uh, in order for, uh, so, the, so the question is, is that, so I guess what you're asking is, does, is there enough imidacloprid in the, excuse me, is there enough uh, emamectin benzoate uh, in the larvae that the woodpeckers are feeding on in order to uh, allow them to accumulate them by if they eat multiple numbers of larvae? And the answer is uh, that, there, that, that when you treat a tree with emamectin benzoate, uh, because we now know that uh, emamectin benzoate kills all four larval stages, uh, there will be uh, these larvae are dead. Okay, so uh, they're dead. They dry out, and these these woodpeckers are are when they search, they search for live larvae. So uh, the chances of them eating a half enough half dead larvae uh, is I, I think is, is somewhat small because these you know because the larvae can't even grow in there. You know so. The beetle lays an egg, the egg has to hatch into a larva, and the larvae has to grow. But if there's any uh, emamectin benzoate in there, the larva is going to die before it, it grows. So uh, the, there's, only, there's only maybe one year when there may be multiple stages of larvae if you're treating uh, later in, in, in the infestation process. But if these trees are protected and treated proactively, the, these woodpeckers simply aren't going to see the larvae because there will be none in there. Okay, um, we have another question. Sure. How long, okay, how long can can a tree be treated before the treatment damage itself causes the tree to decline? How long can the tree? So this is in reference to injecting the trees. Well, it turns out that there is a paper that was uh, that's that's coming out in Arboriculture and Urban Forestry that examines. Uh, the impact of drilling these one and a half inch long holes in the base of trees, and what they found is that the tree hole, the tree heals over quite well, uh, and that there is no so so that uh, there is no um, so the damage caused by the drilling is minimal, and if and if we're going to move from treating once every two years to treating once every three years, then there'll even be less of an impact of the drilling on there. So this, there's this, so, uh, you know, uh, those of you who get arboriculture and urban forestry, uh, you know, this is a refereed journal from the International Society of Arboriculture that demonstrates that these, these, this mode of, of drilling does not harm the tree. So, uh, so in terms of so it doesn't harm the tree, I, I don't think that there's really any limitations. And we're really talking about treating once every three years just during that 10-year invasion cycle. So we're talking pretty much about three, maybe four treatments. Okay, and then afterwards, we're, 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 we're going to be treating once every five years, which gives the tree plenty of time to recover. Okay, um, this is another question that is related to treatments affecting other other insects and species in the environment. Uh, any problems with homeowner, homeowner treatment, and, and in parentheses it says imidacloprid, affecting bees? And I remember we do have an Emerald Ashbor, that in, or Emerald Ashbor University webinar that kind of is related to that as well, so. Yeah, okay, well, well there's, there's two things going on um, with that. Okay, you know, uh, Reed, David Reed? Uh, 
did some work on uh, on this. And, uh, you know, one of the things that we know is that ash are wind pollinated so that bees are not the primary, pollinators are not the primary mechanisms of exchanging pollen. But, that, but if bees are presented ash pollen, they will try to use it. So the circumstances under which that comes would be during a limited time of year when, and in limited locations where the only resources that it's available for the tree for the bees are ash and that's a relatively rare event especially in 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 cities okay uh and and, and actually in cities uh it, it's going to be a a rare event in um in in the forest uh you know because you know because it's expensive to treat uh trees with insecticides uh there's just going to be a small subset of trees that are going to be treated at all. So, um, so, so the thing is, is that if, if you're injecting a tree or you're using a soil applied insecticide, you want to be aware of this. Uh, but uh, I think in many cases, there's, there are many other resources that are available. Well, that said, one of the things that people do, especially around the home, is like a lot of people like to plant flowers around the base of their trees. So if you have a... Uh, say iris or you have a nice annual flower bed of shade let's say impatience you're putting under your uh under your ash tree uh, i would recommend against using a soil trench around those trees because what that will do is that will contaminate those annual flowers or those perennial flowers for the whole season and they will kill bees all right okay not the ash tree above it but they but but the tree but the flowers but below it because they really because the bees are seeking out those seeking out those flowers and in that case an injection of the of, of the insecticide which stays in the tree would uh, minimize any any effect uh on on the pollinators okay um i did find the um web the recorded webinar on that that we have and it's the reed johnson effects of EAB treatments on pollinators, and that was on October 1st of 2015. If anyone wanted to go back and look at that recorded webinar, uh, he, he, he did quite an extensive, um, you know, he did quite an extensive look at that. Um, yeah. So. yeah, I remember he had this graph where he actually uh, looked at the relative abundance of pollen over time during the course of a year. Yeah. So, and, and, and how much of that was 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 supplied by ash trees? Yes, and he also said it, it, that, that also a lot of that information, um, as far as finding out, you know, any is is still being researched too, as far as the extent yep. of this. But you know, so, yep. So, okay. Um, I'm not seeing. Um, any more questions? If anyone has any more questions, um, you can contact Cliff if you wanted to type your um, email address into maybe the, the chat. And, uh, and then you'll send everybody the email about the uh, survey link, right? Correct. Yeah. And I, do, I did put that survey link in the Zoom webinar chat if folks want to go to that as well. Right, it's there now. And if there's not any more questions, um, I will close in just a minute if folks are still trying to get on to that survey.